Hello and welcome to another session in the Gemini series. In this video, I will walk you through the key capabilities of Gemini followed by interesting demos that include accessing the LLM through Vertex AI and AI Studio. We will take a look at prompt engineering for Gemini and also estimating the cost involved in using Gemini. So let's get started. <music> I want to give you five essential facts about Gemini. First of all, Gemini is a multimodal AI, which means it can accept and generate both visual and textual content. You can use text, an image, or both as a prompt. Gemini understands the intricacies of images and even videos that are input as prompts. There are three variants uh, of Gemini, Ultra, which is the most powerful of all the three that supports 1 million context length. Gemini Pro, which is now available in two versions, 1.2 and 1.5. The 1.5 version was just announced recently and it is still in private beta. As soon as it becomes available, I'm going to make a video based on that. Gemini Nano is the smallest of all the three and it is essentially designed for mobile and edge devices. Google's Pixel Pro and Samsung Galaxy S24 are some of the very early mobile phones powered by Gemini Nano. So Gemini is the foundation of multiple Google products and services, including its popular chatbot, which has been recent, recently renamed from Bard to Gemini. Juet AI, which is also now called as Gemini, is powering Google Workspace. You can programmatically access the model through either Vertex AI or AI Studio. I'm going to show you how you can use either of them to gain access to the model. Like other services, Gemini is available through pay-as-you-go pay subscription access. So you can sign up for Google Cloud, have a, a project with billing enabled, and you're good to go. You can gain access to Gemini through the API, or you can use one of your uh, favorite SDKs to get started with uh, Gemini as the foundational model. So let's take a closer look at Gemini. So it is undoubtedly one of the most capable mod models available in the market. It scores higher than GPT-4 in many benchmarks. It's way superior to GPT-4 in code generation and problem solving tasks. You can access it through Vertex AI or AI Studio. So in the upcoming demo, I'm going to show you how you can configure an API key in Google AI Studio and then use a Jupyter Notebook to build your first application based on Gemini. So let's switch to the demo. So in this demo, I'm going to walk you through the steps involved in getting the API key from AI Studio and then using that in a Jupyter Lab environment. So you can currently see that I am on the AI Studio console or the interface and here is the API key. So click on API key and you can generate an API key for your application. Now one thing to note is even though you may not be a Google Cloud customer or you're not a Google Cloud developer, you still need to have an active project in Google Cloud which means you need to have a project with billing enabled so that your usage can be mapped to the Google Cloud billing account, and at the end of the day, you can, you'll be charged. So you still need to have one of the active projects that you can select from here and create an API key. So I've already gone ahead and created an API key, uh, and this is primarily used to access the uh, environment. So once you have the API key, you can set an environment variable. So let me show you uh, here, I'm going to basically uh, access the API key. But before that, let me show you what needs to be installed when you are running this. So
So in my requirements.txt, I have included Google Generative AI, Google Cloud AI platform and Jupyter. So I'm going to leave a link to the article that actually explains all of this. But my requirements.txt looks something like this. So Google Generative AI is the pip module that you need to install on your developer workstation to access this. All right. So once that is done, you can start accessing the model. So first I'm going to import certain modules. So here you actually see I am importing uh, google.generativeai as genai. Uh, this is nothing to do with Google Cloud. It's an independent Python module. I'm also importing some uh, IPython, which is Jupyter Notebook specific modules, just to display and, uh, and, and render the markdown and latex formats. So once we import these modules, the next one is initializing the API. Now I have already set the environment variable in my OS, so that is accessible. Uh, so I have initialized the model. So to test whether the key is working or not, we can invoke, uh, sorry, let me grab this. So we can invoke genai.list models and this is going to show us all the available models. Now you notice there is Gemini 1.0 Pro and also some of the older models based on Palm, uh, Palm 2 like Chat Bison, Text Bison and so on. Gemini Pro Vision is the multimodal AI which we'll explore in the upcoming videos. So this confirms that the API key is valid and we are able to access the endpoint. Perfect. So now let's go ahead and invoke Gemini. So the first thing that I'm going to do is basically uh, set the model to Gemini Pro. And if you don't give any of these monikers, it automatically goes to the latest. So Gemini Pro will translate to uh, this specific moniker, Gemini 1.0 Pro latest. So then I'm going to invoke model.generate content. I have a Python in the backyard. What should I do? And it is going to print the response. So pretty straightforward. This is the hello world equivalent of using Gemini. So now the response is back. Uh, what we can do is to make this readable, I'm going to render that within the Jupyter Notebook. So this looks much better. So it is not advisable to have a Python in your backyard and then it gives us some tips. Perfect. So that is the text generation endpoint of Gemini. So this is one of the mechanisms to access it. But when you are building chatbots, you need to use a different API. So let's explore that. Now, what is the difference between chat completion and text generation? Well, in text generation, you don't uh, really need to maintain history. It's very stateless. You invoke the model with a prompt and it comes back with some response. Whereas the chat completion endpoint can accept history as a parameter, as an input parameter, and it can use that to continue the conversation, which means you don't need to pass uh, additional context every time you invoke the model. Uh, your back and forth conversation or the communication with the model is going to be preserved in the history parameter. So that is the uh, key difference between using text generation endpoint and the chat completion endpoint. So we are going to initialize the uh, chat object here. And then I'm going to first invoke uh, this prompt in one sentence, explain what is AI to a young child. So AI is like super smart helper that can learn, talk, and even draw pictures. So it gives us a one line response. Then I'm going to invoke the send message. Okay, how about a more detailed explanation to a high schooler? Now, if you notice, I'm actually not repeating the prompt. I'm not saying explain what is AI to a high schooler. I'm just continuing my conversation in a very natural style. So when I actually run this, it comes back uh, without any additional prompt being sent. So it comes back with more detailed response because we are targeting a high schooler, not, a, not an infant or a young child. So it comes back with a better detailed response. Now, the beauty of this is 
the access to the history object. Now, if you look at the history uh, property of the chat object, it has parts and then within that, there are multiple roles. So there are two roles. One is the user role, the other one is the model. So uh, in, the, in the user role, I first mentioned in one sentence, explain what is AI to a young child. And then it came back uh, with model role. And then I, I, I repeated uh, the same thing, but without mentioning AI, I just continued my conversation and then it comes back. So this is a pretty neat mechanism to maintain state across conversations. So you can actually access this, for example, history of zero shows us uh, the, the user, then this is the model's response. Now, this is again the user. So you can basically access the entire hierarchy by uh, using this list uh, and also the uh, various keys available in this. So this is a pretty handy mechanism to perform chat, gener chat completion or, 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 or the previous API, which is meant for text generation. So that was a very quick introduction to accessing Gemini through the AI studio. So you need to grab a key and then set the environment variable. And within the environment, environment variable, you are going to uh, 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 get the environment variable from the uh, Jupyter notebook, and then you can access the model. So this is pretty straightforward. And that's the first demo in this uh, session. The next demo, we'll actually repeat this demo but using the Vertex AI Google Cloud SDK. Stay tuned. All right, so one of the prerequisites to access the Vertex AI API is running these two commands, gcloud init followed by gcloud auth application default login. So this command is going to help you cache the credentials so that your API can programmatically access the services of Google Cloud. So let's run this command. And as soon as we do that, the browser pops up and we are going to authenticate ourselves with the GCP environment. So once this is done, basically the credentials are cached at this location. So once that is done, we are good to use the SDK. So Let's go ahead and import the modules. So that's the first step. Uh, now, instead of using the google.generative.ai uh, class, we are actually importing AI platform from google.cloud and of course the Vertex AI related uh, libraries. So once that is done, let's initialize Vertex AI and then we can access Gemini Pro followed by the invocation. So First, we are going to use text completion and then we can access the chat completion API. So we get exactly the same response as the last time. So everything remains the same. We are using the uh, chat object to basically access the history. And uh, you can see the similarity between the libraries, except the first few lines of the code, everything is exactly the same. Okay, let me give this another shot. Okay, let me reinitialize this. I am running the... Okay, now it comes back. So then when we look at the history, it basically shows us the entire history of the conversation. So the key thing to note here is using the gcloud command line to initialize and then get authenticated. And after that, using the Vertex AI specific API uh, to access the model. So in the next demo, I'm going to walk you through some of the prompting or prompt engineering techniques uh, with Gemini. So in this demo, we'll understand how to use zero shot, one shot, and few short prompting techniques with Gemini. Let's get started. 
So we will start by importing the modules exactly like the last demo and then we will initialize the model and set the model to Gemini Pro and then we are going to use zero shot prompting. So zero shot prompt is the most common technique where you basically provide a prompt without any examples or without any uh, previous sample uh, for the model to look up or to generate. So uh, zero shot is basically asking a straight question and then generating the response. So in this prompt, I'm basically saying, imagine a data set showing a significant increase in online retail electronic sales uh, particularly in mobile devices and wearable technology provide an analysis of this trend. So this is a very creative mechanism or a creative technique to generate uh, some content and there is no precedence. The model has not been given any examples and let's see what this actually does. So this is going to basically perform some kind of a uh, fictitious analysis on the market trends and then it comes back with uh, some response. Now this is called the zero shot prompting because we are not providing any examples. Now let me show you what is one shot prompt. So one shot prompt is giving some examples, at least one example. So uh, in this prompt I'm saying you are a language translator specializing in English and French. Don't say anything else but the value and here is the sentence in English and its translation. So we are providing Ian, hello, how are you? And then the fringe response. Now translate the following sentence. I am doing well, thank you. So now when we actually invoke the model based on this, it is going to come back and translate the input into French. So uh, here it's pretty clear that we have one example that is telling the model what's the pattern and how it should follow. So when you have more than one example, it becomes few shot. But if you give exactly one, this is called one shot prompting. So similarly, I'm going to give another prompt, uh, which already has a Japanese haiku. And I want the model to generate a new haiku based on the prompt. So now here is an example haiku. Now write a new haiku about the autumn season. So this is again called a one shot prompt because we already gave an example and expecting the model to generate another response based on that. Now I want to show you what is few shot prompting. Now This is pretty powerful and it actually sends some kind of a mini data set, miniature data set to the model. So here I'm actually saying you are a helpful AI assistant. Please be concise in your responses and based on the example below, complete the task. Uh, Example one, the sun raises in the east, so it, it goes ahead and completes. The other one is an apple a day keeps the doctor away and then uh, we want the model to complete the final one. So uh, let's go ahead and run this. So, oops, I, ne I need to execute this cell first and then, yeah, so the pen is mightier than this one. So it basically completes because it understands how the previous examples are set. Now I want to show you a very powerful prompt uh, in, the, in the context of a uh, few shot prompting. So here I have a prompt that is very uh, precise but at the same time not very simple. So I'm giving two examples where I have reversed the word. For example, I have given bread, toast and then butter. And the previous two outputs are basically the reverse of the actual input. Now, I'm not saying perform reverse or uh, uh, no instruction at all. I'm just saying below are the examples, complete the task. Now, Gemini is so powerful that it figures out that the first two are basically uh, reversing the original input and it automatically runs or, or generates the response based on that. There we go. This is pretty powerful. It even picks up the uh, capitalization of the first character. Now, uh, this is what is called the few shot prompting.
Now, one thing that I want to call out, particularly if you come from open AI background, Gemini prompt doesn't have a, a differentiation between system, uh, human, and AI. Typically, those are the three roles that you may be using with any of the LLMs, but Gemini doesn't have these roles. It doesn't have a system role where you can set a global context saying, oh, you are so-and-so, and throughout my conversation, you're going to help me with this. That is the global setting, which is a system prompt. And then there is uh, the, the user role where you'll actually say, hey, I am a market research analyst. I want to perform this. And uh, you'll actually send the prompt. And then there is an AI role, which is the model uh, uh, performing the actual completion or uh, the generation. So those are the three uh, typically used with OpenAI uh, and GPT-4 when you are using the chat completion endpoint. Now, it's important to note that Gemini doesn't have that differentiation or distinction between the user role and the AI role. Uh, you just need to have singular prompt that consists of everything. So it's actually easy that way because uh, you can basically construct a, a long prompt that contains everything that you want. And one of the reasons why it is designed like that is it's a multimodal uh, AI. So it, it, it has to accept images or text and it doesn't make sense to clearly differentiate system, user and AI. Uh, so it is one singular prompt that is going to be uh, acting as the input to the LLM. So that brings us uh, to the last demo where I'm going to walk you through the context length and how to basically perform some kind of a cost estimate based on the tokens. Stay tuned. All right. So in this demo, I want to show you how to count the tokens and how to translate that into your billable tokens. So let's start by importing the modules and then initializing the model. And then let's perform the count of tokens. So here is the prompt. And then if you look at the length of the prompt, it is basically, oops. So this is translating to 43 characters. So that is basically our uh, string length, which is the prompt. Now you can perform this you can run this function called count tokens. And what this does is it basically comes back with the total number of tokens that are translated from this prompt. And it also gives you the total number of billable characters. So uh, Vertex AI has a pricing scheme. Currently, Gemini is under technical preview. It is not uh, billed yet. But once it becomes generally available, the billing starts. So at that point, the number of characters that are uh, counted towards billing is basically 34. Now it, it uses some kind of a tokenization where it avoids white spaces and other punctuation characters and so on uh, to come, come back with total billable characters. And in this case, it's only 34. So this method, which is model.countTokens and uh, uh, passing the prompt will tell you precisely how much it's going to cost just for the input. Now, if you really want to uh, invoke the model, get the response, and then take a look at the metadata. So I'm actually sending a prompt that says, why is the shape of raindrop spherical? It comes back with some explanation. Now, I want to look at the usage metadata. So prompt token count is 11. Now, that's what is shown here. And then candidate token count is 210. Uh, and total token count is 221. So candidates token count is basically the token count of the response. So uh, total token count, the prompt plus the output generated by the LLM is 221. So your billing is going to be impacted by this. So whenever Gemini is moving to general, general availability and then the billing starts, this is a very handy mechanism to estimate your budget and understand um, how many tokens or how many billable characters have been generated uh, from this prompt. So that is uh, a technique. So model.count model tokens and then 
the usage metadata are two important uh, functions and method uh, or a property to basically access uh, the, the token size and translating that into the cost. So that brings us to the end of this recording, this session. Uh, no, I'm going to do, do this again. So that brings us to the end of this session. I hope you found this useful. In the next session, I'm going to walk you through the RAG implementation, Retrieval Augmented Generation with Google Vertex AI Vector Search and Gemini. So it's going to be an interesting demo where we'll go through all the steps involved in configuring the vector search and then creating a RAG pipeline to perform Q&A on PDFs that we upload uh, to a Google cl uh, Cloud Storage bucket. Stay tuned and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Thank you.